thank you for coming on this gray day. Um, I think that um, the monitor is showing that this is recording. Okay. Um, a, a few years ago, I guess maybe six, eight, ten years ago by now, it occurred to me that in a course called The History of Urban Form, it was that the new urbanism had grown legs and matured sufficiently where it needed to be included uh, at some point in some way in this course. So I made it this optional lecture. Um, shortly after that, probably about eight years ago, a new term emerged uh, typically called landscape urbanism. Um, and for reasons that remain somewhat mysterious to me, uh, the people who ascribe to the landscape urbanism movement seem to be in opposition to the new urbanist movement and so on and so forth. Um, it's really kind of strange um, because I think they're both flawed in kind of odd ways. Um, but both of them come about as a reaction to uh, the CIAM and um, the Athens Charter and the sort of principles, the axiomatic principles of the modern city uh, as it emerged in the um, mid uh, middle part of the 20th century. And enough projects have been built and enough freeways have been built and enough sort of, you know, uh, zoning had been around long enough and so forth. And the problems of the 19th century city, primarily public health and other kinds of things, had, had dissolved to a substantial degree. So that there was a clear kind of dissatisfaction um, about the kinds of cities that, that we were building. And uh, so both of these, both new urbanism and landscape urbanism, emerge as a radical critique of the modern city and in reaction to it. So they're reactionary in, in, a, in a very direct way. Um, so this is simply to try to sort of um, give you a little bit of the history of how this developed. And um, I will point out where I think the flaws are um, as we go through. So um, to quote Cullen Rowe, the intention of the modern city was to be a fitting home of the noble savage, a being so aboriginally pure necessitated a domicile of equal purity. Um, and the ideal form of this, as it emerged in the Ville Radieuse, is in fact what we see here on the left-hand side of the screen. And the reality of, of its influence is what we see represented here in these um, photographs of the Horner Housing, Public Housing Project in Chicago, built in 1957, and the Milwaukee Freeway Interchange at the site of former Bronzeville community, 1959 and 1988. These may be a bit extreme, but uh, even in Atlanta, uh, there was a 25-year court fight to prevent uh, the Department of Transportation from running uh, an interstate highway through Druid Hills and out through Decatur. Um, originally, the stub, you know, when you come off the downtown connector and you make a right going toward the Carter Presidential Library, Virginia Highlands, that area, it's sort of you come to a stoplight at uh, Boulevard. And... Um, that, um, that was actually um, because of this court suit where civic associations and neighborhoods, uh, the Morningside neighborhood and others were um, banning together and filing suit to prevent the state from actually um, building this, building this um, freeway. Are you familiar with uh, Virginia Avenue, where the where the beach volleyball court is? You know where I'm talking about? If you're at Grady Stadium on Virginia Avenue going toward Taco Mac, on the right-hand side there is a little park and there's a so volley, volleyball thing there. Well, that area was right-of-way that was acquired by the Department of Transportation and the houses were torn down. And um, uh, that was intended to be a diamond interchange, right? freeway interchange. 
which would have disrupted, which would have taken out Inman Middle School, which would have disrupted uh, the connection to Virginia Highlands from Midtown, et cetera. Um, I mean, those plans were not just on the boards, those were actually partly implemented. And so this, uh, this dissatisfaction was, um, was fairly substantial and uh, was fairly uniform across the country. There was not much that um, in the 19, uh, from the late 1960s to the 1970s that were viewed as being um, particularly successful. People were stuck in traffic all over the place. Um, they had experienced uh, what they considered to be a decline in the overall quality of, of the physical environment of their neighborhoods and their towns. And there was this dissatisfaction with, um, with this. So it's not just public housing. It was also just a general dissatisfaction with um, the kinds of cities we were building. Now, um, these, th this is all uh, CIAM. Um, but if we sort of go back and look, they're, they're also coming in through zoning. We have this kind of constellation of things that arose out of the New York Regional Plan Association and uh, the plan for Radburn, New Jersey in 1929, which um, included uh, Clarence Perry's idea of the neighborhood unit, uh, so on and so on and so forth. And zoning, which segregated out um, commercial activity um, from residential activity and created what was essentially, it was kind of ironic because this was intended to be a town for the motor age, but the separation of the pedestrian from the vehicle um, coupled with zoning uh, produced landscapes like we see up above, which again, people were uh, somewhat dissatisfied with, um, primarily because you couldn't walk anywhere. <laughs> So um, these, these idealized versions of, of the new city um, found their way into, um, into law and into practice in a big way by the end of World War II. And um, 30 years after that, you know, about the mid-70s at least, uh, this kind of dissatisfaction had spawned a number of critiques of um, both CIM and um, Radburn and so forth. Just to, just to make this point, when I was an undergraduate in the 1960s, um, if we, and we had a course, in a, a studio design course in subdivision design as a landscape architect, and if, if our designs uh, required that the, a child have to cross a street to get to the park, we got an automatic F. Right, so there's a whole generation of people running firms out there now who were taught that. And one thing I've learned in my 66 years is that um, these things, sort of practices, doesn't matter what field you're in, these kinds of uh, practices uh, become almost like religion. They become like faith. That you know, there isn't, there is an arterial, a collector, and a distributor, and a local, and that's the way it is. And Moses came off the mount, and that was the 11th through the 14th commandments, right? And so you don't, you can't, it's difficult to kind of mess with people's religion when they really sort of believe with this. But there was no empirical evidence whatsoever that it was superior in any way to cities that had, perhaps in terms of hygiene, but that was about it. So um, in 1993, um, a group had formed um, to write the charter uh, of the new urbanism. And this book, it's called a charter um, because it in fact is deliberately set as a critique of the Athens charter. So if we have the CIAM up here on the top and we have then the critique of that down here on the bottom, um, I'm trying to set this up as a kind of opposition. Now, it really began much earlier than that, and it was, it's rare that this happens. Um, usually there is a series of books and principles. We see that with Le Corbusier. We see version architecture being published and then sort of a few projects 
uh, the Villa Savoy being the primary among them, uh, actually then illustrating his principles, right? But in the case of new urbanism, it was actually a project that then led to uh, the development of this um, of, of the of the larger sort of textual theories behind it, and it came from um, it's, most of you, some of you have probably been there, Seaside, Florida, and so I wanted to take you through this uh, kind of as an historical journey uh, to tell you uh, what I know of how this actually came about. Uh, this is um, the original plan. And it was on a piece of land that was owned by um, uh, a man named uh, Robert Davis, who was the developer, who had been, uh, who he, he had inherited this property from his grandfather, J.S. Smolian, um, who had bought 80 acres um, near Seagrove Beach on the Gulf Coast. Um, and his intention was to build a summer camp for his employees, but his business partner wanted no part of what seemed like a worthless tract of sand and something that would simply cost money and he saw no particular benefit in. Um, the Smolian family, however, continued coming to this same shore every summer and occasionally J.S. would take uh, young Robert, his grandson, to the fields at the western edge of Seagrove Beach and walk around the property. Robert Davis grew up to be a student of history as well as business and became an award-winning builder and developer in Miami. Um, in the 1970s. Uh, so he began to hatch a scheme uh, for the development of this property. And uh, it really was Robert Davis, the developer, who was driving this whole thing. He hired an architect, and this is the plan that um, was prepared by, um, by a, an architect named Altman. Don't know anything about him. Uh, this is actually a highway state highway that runs through here, and um, this is 80 acres. It's not very big. We see here Route 30A, I'm sorry, running right through here. Uh, and if we sort of look at this, what we see is, is a sort of um, some form of the Radburn plan that has been kind of modified by some CIEM uh, principles. And um, if we look at this sort of shaded in swath in some detail, we'll see this maybe a little bit clearer, where there is this sort of um, straight avenue with these curves and these little duplex units, um, so on and so on and so forth. Um, Davis was dissatisfied with Altman's scheme. It was not what he had in mind, and he turned to a young firm that had just been formed in uh, Miami in 1979. That firm was Architectonica. Um, it was only two years old. The five partners were Roberto Fort Brescia, Lorinda Spear, Ervin Oromni, Andres Duani, and Elizabeth platter -Zyberg. Now, Architectonica was um, an aggressively modern firm, as we'll see in a moment. But the partners in charge of the development of the Seaside Tract um, was actually uh, Elizabeth platter Zyberg, who is now Dean of the School of Architecture at the University of Miami, and um, Andres Duani. Uh, later, they fell in love and got married, and um, this whole event, not that, but the whole sort of um, development of Seaside caused a split in the firm of Architectonica with Duani and platter Zyberg separating out and forming their own firm. Architectonica is still doing quite well. They were the architects of Phillips Arena, for example, in downtown Atlanta where the Hawks play. Uh, just to familiarize you, if you are not familiar with Architectonica's work from the 1970s, this is probably their most iconic building. Uh, if you ever watched Miami Vice on television or saw the movie, this was actually in the opening scene of the, of the TV show. Uh, there's a swimming pool here. This is the building with the hole in it. And there's a swimming pool here uh, with a diving board where you can sort of dive off, very sort of Miami. And um, the uh, Atlantis, called the Atlantis Condominium, built between 1980 and 82. Um, so you can imagine the internal discord that uh, began to develop among the five partners uh, over Seaside. So the original Dwani Platter-Zyberg uh, plan 
the architect, still architect Tonica, uh, developed this scheme, rerouting Highway 30A to the curve. And we see the curve here coming down. And then uh, this plan caused serious disagreement among the partners. Dwani and Platters Ibert wanted 30A to remain as the principal highway running through a coastal town with the downtown or village center off of the highway. Davis too began to conceive of Seaside as a town similar to the ones he had known as a boy growing up on the Gulf Coast. Uh, the agreement was to have a charrette, that is a sort of intense two-day um, sort of design experience with the developer and the architects to come up uh, with a plan. Notice that there's the beginnings of a kind of picturesque suburb that we see over here on the right, uh, on the left, rather. Um, the plan as it emerged from the charrette, uh, the circle has been replaced by blocks and the suburb is gone. The disagreements among the partners in the firm would lead to the split with Dwani platters Iberg leaving Architectana Architectonica taking Robert Davis with them. Um, with modifications, this is the plan that more or less would be built. Uh, the plan was then sent to the British architect Leon Creer uh, for his critique, and Creer regularized the blocks and added a differentiated lot structure with a more clearly articulated town center. Um, Sometime about this time, the possibility of Seaside as an incorporated city began to come into play. This was Leon Carrier's redrawing of the town, with the focus of the town center being civic and market functions surrounding a central park, not unlike early garden cities, in concept anyway. Uh, the final plan. Now, the problem with this became immediately how to implement this, how to build it because it violated every single zoning ordinance and subdivision regulation in the county. Every single one of them. Uh, there's a certain irony, I think, if we go to Savannah and you build out their current zoning ordinance, you could not build downtown Savannah under Savannah's current zoning ordinance. It would be illegal, okay? So um, we see these ironies like this all the time. Well, Davis obviously had been, um, at some point already thinking about this, and so he decided that he would um, take this through the legislature and uh, incorporate as, the, uh, as a separate municipal town, right? Legally chartered in the Constitution of the state of Florida. Why would he do that? Because if it was a legal municipality, then they could write their own zoning ordinance. They didn't have to conform to the county zoning ordinance because they could write their own laws. And that's what they did. Um, and that was actually, I think, a stroke of brilliance on his part. The final plan as it was rendered for the real estate office. And um, then they did. So the question is, what should the zoning ordinance be? And if you've seen most of these, they look like the ones from the last lecture that we see in Gwinnett County or something where they're about this thick can go on Municode and look it up. You can see that it's in multiple sections. Each one has setback requirements and other kinds of things. So they decided they would reduce this to what later would be called form-based codes, saying that if you had a certain kind of a street and you had certain limitations on height, sidewalk width, um, you had to have front porches, you had to have these other kinds of things. And um, they began to sort of play with this um, here in these sketches. And then um, this was the draft of the code. So each lot in the town, each private lot, uh, was classified. Um, and as such, then, uh, if it was a type 1 or a type 2 or a type 3, these rules applied to that particular kind of lot. Um, I should go ahead and advance and tell you that in the end, the zoning ordinance of the town of Seaside was two sheets of paper, 24 by 36 inches. That was it, right? So far, so good. Um, so they then got Leon Creer to test, um, to test the um, this code that they had written, and this is one of the drawings that he came up with for 
a typical type, whatever that is, type F lot, and um, where the parking would go and so on and so forth. And um, that's something we don't do enough of. Uh, we put out zoning ordinances, as I said, since I've been teaching at Georgia Tech, 37 years this fall. Um, the um, Atlanta has gone through four complete revisions of its zoning ordinance. But never are these simulated in any way. And I was telling Mark after class that it's like drug companies um, you can imagine sort of putting out drugs into the marketplace without ever getting FDA approval or clinical trials or anything. It's just saying, well, we don't know. This may kill you or it may help you. We really don't know. Just, you know, take these $2,000 pills, one a day uh, with breakfast, and we'll see what happens. And I think that's kind of what zoning has become in the United States, that it's sort of just kind of putting these laws out there and, uh, and then not uh, w without any simulation whatsoever of what the place would actually look like if, if these were actually built out. Um, and I will tell you from experience that if you do simulate it, guess what? It looks pretty much like what's out there, right? These laws actually do control um, the spatial formation um, of our cities. And then Liz platters Eiberg did a remarkable thing, which I think is very intelligent. She was teaching at Catholic University in the summertime, and uh, she decided to take this code and to run a studio where she would then give her students um, the code and a series of lots, and then would have them sort of build to the code. And uh, this is what the model looked like when the students built it. And that's when they thought they were really on to something. That was when they thought, okay, this actually will work. Now, the idea behind this is that the developer would build a sort of constitutional order, the sort of public parts, and then individuals would buy lots and would not necessarily have to hire an architect. They could just hire a builder, and they could kind of build a the thing themselves according to this code. Uh, this was actually Davis's desire, the developer's desire, because he wanted the, this to be like one of these towns he had grown up in, enjoying as a boy these sort of vernacular small towns on the coast, on the Gulf Coast. And so this is what uh, then the developer was going to build, build out the public parts public buildings, and then the private buildings would, would be subject to this, to this code. This is the code then as it was finally revised after um, this test. And um, this is actually an example of the code as it exists to this day. Um, they attracted a number of, um, a lot of people were intrigued by, um, by, this, um, by this idea. And so there were a lot of well-known architects, in addition to Leon Creer, who, as a fee, was given a lot so that he could build his own house. One is Rodolfo Machado and Jorge Silvetti. Silvetti was chair of the School of Architecture at Harvard at the time. And um, so very well-known, award-winning uh, architects. And um, the Machado and Silvetti building was actually never built. Uh, Robert A.M. Stern, who is currently dean at Yale, um, actually was uh, given the commission to design a hotel. And Caroline Constant, who is currently on the faculty at the University of Michigan, uh, was given, um, was in at the University of Florida, was given uh, the commission to design the town fire station. <laughs> And then um, immediately, almost, this began to create uh, Seaside as it sort of became known. Um, and the sort of word of it sort of rippled through the architectural community, began to come under heavy criticism, uh, some of it quite virulent. And um, in fact, the first Anywhere conference that was organized by Peter Eisenman, who was then on the faculty at Princeton, and his wife, Cynthia Davidson, took on Seaside as a, quote, elitist, backward-looking, nostalgic sort of thing, which was uh, clearly a no-no. Um, 
In other words, to use the terms that we had introduced earlier in the course, it took on, to borrow Francois Chouet's term, a culturalist view of the world as opposed to a progressist view of the world. So in part, to counter these claims, and in part to prove that the idea of the urban code did not of necessity dictate picket fences and front porches, or more correctly, that such dictates did not restrict architects to mundane interpretations of these dictates, Seaside encouraged several modern design designs. Tony Ames is a very, very, very good architect here in Atlanta, uh, was hired to develop a plan for the Cruise House, which was never built, demonstrating it, but this design was published in a number of architectural journals um, to show that this house, um, which is very modern, met the code in every possible way. But a combination of the public outcry, in other words, the neighbors didn't want this modern thing built next door, and, um, and the client's desire for a more traditional approach scuttled the whole, the whole project. So this never got built. Stephen Hole was hired to uh, design the t uh, sort of town hall, what was called then later the hybrid public building. It had ground floor retail, sort of civic offices, police station, those kinds of things incorporated within it. And this won an honor award, PA uh, honor award um, for its design. And Hole is a very highly regarded modern architect. Um, all of this was aimed at blunting some of this um, criticism of that the whole conception of Seaside was somewhat nostalgic. This is actually what Davis had had in mind, that uh, the majority of the private housing would not be designed by architects, and this was his original intent, that it would simply be these sort of vernacular cottages that individuals could come down, buy a lot, and build. Um, this is the plan as built. Now, Regardless of the sort of backstory and the sort of uh, silly infighting at conferences in New York and so forth, um, or at Yale, um, this struck a chord with the public that was, uh, it was almost like it came in from out of left field. And I realized that this had matured sometime in the late 80s when Atlantic Magazine, uh, on its cover, uh, had, had a photograph of part of Seaside, and the cover story was a better place to live, right? So in the popular press, if you start seeing these kinds of things emerging in Time magazine or something, then you know that it has grown legs to the point where this isn't going to go away. Um, I knew there was a, a relief pitcher. Anybody in here a Braves fan? All right. You know John Rocker? You remember John Rocker? Remember him? Right. Um, I knew that he was in real trouble when Jay Leno started making jokes about him on The Tonight Show. Right. Up to that point, I wasn't sure. So when this appeared in Time Magazine, uh, I was pretty sure that what it had done, it had struck a chord. I'm not sure what that chord was or where it was, but it struck a chord with the public in a way that meant that this was not going to go away anytime soon. Um, not that it should, but, um, but it really did strike a chord with it. This is Seaside as it was built. Now, it's a very desirable place, and so it still comes under enormous criticism for being elitist. I mean, a lot down here, which originally sold for not very much money, a few thousand dollars, is now a million. And um, that gives you some sense of um, if the law of supply and demand uh, applies here, it's straight economics. Um, there's a high demand and um, very popular um, to, this, to this day. This is what it actually sort of looks like as it was built out. Now, in the meantime, and at the same time, on the West Coast, there were a group of people uh, who were working completely independently from Duane, Platter, Zyberg, um, Seaside, everything else. Uh, developing other theoretical models sympathetic to a rejection of the modern precepts of the CIM in favor of street, lot, block, higher densities, and transit-oriented urban development. Um, sort of the person who became the default leader of this was a man named Peter Calthorpe, uh, who published a book in 1993, The Next American Metropolis, 
put out by Princeton Architectural Press, um, which was sort of built very much around the concepts of the neighborhood unit. It's interesting to compare the diagram at the right of transit-oriented development with Clarence Perry's diagram of the neighborhood unit. Um, many local governments uh, latched on to this idea, and uh, it is not uncommon if you go through the metropolitan Atlanta area to find a zoning category called TOD, or transit-oriented development, where certain parking requirements and so forth are waived uh, if you are within a certain distance of a MARTA station or something else. That's become fairly common across the country now. Well, the group on the West Coast, it's like sort of, you know, hip-hop and rap. It was a kind of West Coast group and, a, and an East Coast group. And originally they were sort of competitive and they came together to form, um, these are sort of hypothetical uh, studio type projects that were done by Calthorpe and infill development according to these TOD principles. And uh, so all these people came together eventually to form something called the Congress for the New Urbanism. And um, it's um, Daniel Solomon from San Francisco, Elizabeth Platter Zyberg, Andres Duani, um, Stefanos Palazoides, and then Curiously, hiding in the shadows is Robert A.M. Stern, who's now dean at Yale. It's kind of strange um, back there. Now, if you actually read this, um, it's pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing that anyone would want to actually take issue with what this actually says. It says that we advocate restructuring public policy and development practices to support neighborhoods that are diverse in use and population, communities that are designed for the pedestrian and transit as well as the car. Cities and towns should be shaped by physically designed and universally accessible public space and community institutions. And urban places should be framed by architecture and landscape design that celebrates local history, climate, and building practice. I mean, this is sort of like saying, you know, I believe that we should all be friendly and neighbors and love your mother and respect, you know, the law. I mean, how do you, how do you op oppose this, right? It's sort of hard. Well, nonetheless, um, foaming at the mouth, a lot of people opposed it, um, which unfortunately created um, a degradation of any serious dialogue that might have occurred around these issues. Following on uh, this, Duane and Platter Zyberg developed something um, which actually was drawn from um, actually drawn from um, forestry practice called the transect. Uh, a transect is where foresters who are mapping the ecology of a of a national park, let's say the Nantahala National Forest would walk in a straight line, let's say a bearing of north 45 degrees east for a certain number of miles, and then every uh, 20 feet they would stop and record all the vegetation growing within um, a 10-foot uh, radius of where they were, right? And what that does is it creates a map that, that shows you that north slopes and south slopes have different communities. Valleys have different plant communities. Ridge tops have different plant communities that can be correlated with the geology, soil depth, hydrology, and other things. Um, makes perfect sense. So they got the idea of sort of saying, well, let's apply this then to, um, to towns. So that if you had, um, you know, a traditional courthouse town or even Manhattan for that matter, you would have one kind of code that would apply to that, a second one that would code, to, say, Midtown, Atlanta, to the inner ring suburbs, to the outer ring suburbs, and so forth, and that these should be different. The thing that really I find striking about this is that uh, by the similarity of this sort of zoning concept to what we s I have no idea why this is doing this, as a sort of... Um, Similarity to what we see in the Ville Radius here uh, with the sort of administrative center that we see up here, this green belt, then, then here we have the sort of housing band, 
uh, warehouses and so forth, factories and this kind of stuff that we see here. In other words, the idea of sort of creating a different set of rules for how uh, something should be um, developed. This transect code drew, has drawn an enormous amount of attention. And if you talk to the if you talk to the lawyers who have ever tried, there are a few municipalities, one in Colorado, some in Washington and Oregon and so forth, who've tried to, and some in Florida that have tried to <laughs> tried to implement this. They say you just really can't do it. You, you just it's uh, it just is too it, it just doesn't work. Um, but it still has it still has a certain uh, appeal, and um, there are still people out there passing these transect codes. I I don't know what's going on here, but it doesn't seem to want to do this. In practice, uh, some of these are actually say, the city of Wilsonville, which I believe is actually in Colorado, uh, attempted uh, to do this. And it created um, uh, certain problems. A few, most of the sort of projects that got built were single sort of development projects, which were somewhat isolated from the surrounding urban fabric, which is what the transect was trying to avoid. Um, but um, the federal Hope Six redevelopment program, which um, actually came in the early days of the late days of the Clinton and early days of the Bush administration, uh, which tore down a lot of public housing and um, sort of rebuilt it along more traditional lines, uh, and then these kind of town centers. And I think it's instructive that they've, it's, it's now changed, but on the website of the Congress of New Urbanism, the ideal urban street is this image. And I happen to recognize that because it's Broad Street in downtown Athens, Georgia built in the 19th century. I think that's sort of interesting. Um, well, these debates about backward-looking, forward-looking, modern traditionalists, neo-traditionalists, and so forth, uh, continued. And then um, something called landscape urbanism, or uh, occasionally called ecological urbanism, uh, began to emerge in um, uh, as sort of really out of left field um, as something which challenged new urbanism. Um, <laughs> it was um, begun by uh, Charles Waldheim, who is currently the chair of the Department of Landscape Architecture at Harvard University's Graduate School of Design. And he published a book called The Landscape Urbanism Reader, which I have tried to read. Um, the term gained traction is now discussed in urban design and planning circles to a sufficient degree to address to a small degree in this course. Um, it, is, it is a very, very elusive term. And to um, distill it down, um, my take on it is that the last landscape urbanism project to be built was the Emerald Necklace in Boston, Olmsted's Back Bay where um, a natural system became incorporated into parkways and public spaces and institutions and so forth in the Back Bay that became then the structure of a whole sort of pattern of metropolitan growth. Uh, that that comes first. You piggyback parkland on top of sewer reconstruction, et cetera. Um, an example that's often used um, by the proponents of landscape urbanism is the High Line in New York. I mean, it's an abandoned elevated rail line that was converted into a park. I don't know how that becomes. It's sort of like, what? It's sort of like a roof garden on this building or something. I mean, it would be sort of difficult to imagine this having, um, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a specific project. George Hargraves who uh, preceded Charles Waldheim as chair at Harvard, was asked when he gave a lecture here uh, about two years ago, um, the, this particular project, which is Hargrave's plan for the London Olympics, this master plan that daylighted an old stream in the east end of London, 
and then created the fabric in which all of the venues of the Olympics were actually um, sort of brought together into a single sort of comprehensive public space. And this is often used as an example of, of landscape urbanism. Um, when Hargraves was lecturing here at Georgia Tech, he was asked this question by an assistant professor of city planning in the College of Architecture, and Hargraves replied, no, it is not landscape urbanism. I am a landscape architect, and this is landscape architecture. And it's interesting because that was my initial reaction as well, that uh, landscape urbanism is actually landscape architecture with another name. But because most people think landscape architecture is actually putting shrubs around buildings, um, it was sort of necessary, uh, perhaps in certain circles, to feel like you, you needed to rebrand it somehow so that it somehow became different. I don't know. Um, I am of an age where I have lived through enough isms to uh, be immediately skeptical of anything with an ism on the end of it whether it's old urbanism, new urbanism, landscape urbanism, any kind of ism, postmodernism, <coughs> if it has an ism on the end of it, it's like a sort of suspect category. You know, it sort of it pops up a red flag, and I immediately need to kind of go, you know, get into it and sort of try to deconstruct the thing to try to figure out what in the heck they're really talking about. It doesn't mean that I don't agree with a good bit of it. It doesn't mean that I think it should be dismissed. Rather, on the contrary, it means I think we should pay particular attention to it because if it has evolved to the point where it can, can, can become an ism, uh, then it likely is going to grow legs and people in academic institutions will have conferences on it and journals will carry debates about it and so on and so forth. And so it then becomes sort of necessary to, um, uh, to sort of try to figure it, figure it out. So I have provided some links here. Um, that if you're interested in, in this, uh, you know, might be helpful in trying to figure it out. Um, basically, what it means is like the back bay, you sort of project out this kind of um, urban infrastructure that is built around ecological principles. And then what Waldheim will say is then you add in urbanism. What kind of urbanism? We don't know. You can just add it in, right? Um, and um, so really, landscape urbanism tends to kind of view the Radburn plan as a good thing. So all those people that couldn't have the kids cross the street to get to the park that I was talking about. And, um, and um, they're really not very clear on what the actual city uh, become. So um, this cartoon was something that I, I forget where I found this. It was on the New Urban Network, and I thought it actually was um, pretty, whoever drew this understood it. Um, one might be a progressist view, the other a culturalist view, again, to borrow these terms from Francois Chouet, which I find reductivist but useful. Uh, the truth is, um, are we biological animals or are we political animals? And I would argue that we are, in fact, both. We are both inhabitants of the earth and we are social and political. That is in our nature. Uh, so if nature is determinant, then where do you draw the line? Uh, the boundary, the tectonic division that joins me and separates me from my neighbor, um, this constitutional order. So should we add a third one to this? Do I need to do that if I teach this course next year to introduce the natural order? I'm not sure. I don't think I can. I think that's beyond me at this point. Um, but I do like this diagram, which was taken from the frontispiece of a book, great book, by Clarence Glacken cultural historian, um, dead now, but uh, who wrote a book called um, It's a Sort of History of Environmental Thought in the Western Tradition. Um, and um, it's called Traces on the Rhodian Shore. 
And in this diagram, in this drawing, uh, as described by Vitruvius in Book 6 of De Architectura, a stipus, a Socratic philosopher, is shipwrecked and cast upon the shore of the island of Rhodes. He noticed some geometric diagrams drawn on the beach and said to his companions, we can hope for the best for I see the signs of men. This story and its moral that geometric diagrams and their constructed outcomes, i.e. cities, indicate not just humanity but civilization itself. We are at once social, biological, and political, and the city is the natural outcome of all of those natures. To quote my teacher, the most profound quote I think I ever learned from him, and I learned a great deal from him, J.B. Jackson, Boundaries make farmers out of wanderers, neighbors out of farmers, and citizens out of neighbors. Right? Something there is that doesn't love a wall. The city is the largest man-made artifact ever made. It is an engineered environment and a collective work of architecture built over time. It was here before we were, and it will be here when we are gone. We inherit this collective artifact. We will intervene in it in an attempt to make it better for ourselves and for future generations yet to come. So we are the curators of this artifact, and as such, we have to care for it. Are there any questions? Yes. Well, I think um, it is old urbanism writ new. I mean, it is Virginia Highlands. It is downtown Athens. You know, that's what the ideal would be. Um, I think there's a flaw in that occurred early on, and we see it in the code for seaside, where the constitutional order and the economic order were conflated into a single ordinance, which is the same flaw that I see with the diminishment of subdivision regulations and the city planning enabling statutes and the dependency that has developed really since World War II on zoning as the primary tool, legal tool, for the development of cities. I don't think you can regulate a city into being. You have to build it, right? And so I think the emphasis on the regulation may have been the flaw uh, at Seaside. Now, um, what's good about it? Um, to some degree, they separated constitution from economic, uh, the political from the economic. To some degree, they understood that zoning has physical consequences and physical uh, um, results. And so the creation of something where you're simulating what that would turn into, I think, was a very positive thing. I wish all cities would do that. Um, unfortunately for them, I think, it became um, associated with neo-traditionalist design. And because of that, uh, it got somehow linked up to what was the opposite of any avant-garde position one might take. And as a result, it became then a sort of foaming at the mouth um, diatribe, you know, developed against it. Um, I think it's unfair to criticize Seaside as just the example we've been discussing for being elitist because wealthy people live there. Well, I mean, wealthy people live in Newport, Rhode Island. It's because of the demand for something um, that people are willing to pay high prices for. It. Wealthy people live in on the 42nd floor of a of an apartment building in Manhattan, right? I mean, it's sort of it seems to me that that's a red herring. You know, if you have a really nice place on the beach anywhere in the world, <laughs> it's going to cost you a lot of money to live there. You know, that's that's a fact. So I think that's sort of a red herring. Um, so if I had to reduce it down, I would say that what it depends upon primarily is the, uh, is the reduction of block size going back to traditional nomenclatures of streets 
um, tr attempting to create a simplified set of regulations that then v people will interpret in a variety of different ways. That's the, I think that's what the core of it would be. The, the new urbanists are very um, cognizant and defensive about this association with neo-traditional design. The former chair, the president of the Congress of New Urbanism, was the mayor of Milwaukee. Um, and they were meeting here in Atlanta a few years ago, and I went to a reception and got into a conversation with him. And he was talking about how much he loved Ellen Dunham Jones, who's on the faculty of, here in the School of Architecture, uh, who's now the president of the Congress of New Urbanism nationally. Uh, and they liked Ellen because she was a modernist. You know, I, I found that sort of interesting that it, it, it somehow, in all this kind of complex world of how we actually build cities that are better places to live, we come down to these kind of very abstract sort of terms of neo-traditionalist or modernist or this or that. I mean, what do we really mean by that, right? Um, and I find that not very useful. And he, the mayor of Milwaukee was not a stupid guy, let me tell you. He was a really sharp guy, very likable, very astute. Um, but like a lot of mayors, um, you, you, you would be pleasantly surprised. Uh, Richard Dagenhart, some of you may know, my colleague, um, got a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts to run something called the Mayor's Institute. The Mayor's Institute began with the, um, um, what's it called, the League of Mayors or the League of Cities or something, which is an organization, national organization of mayors, um, combined with the National Endowment for the Arts. And they would convene these uh, three-day workshops where you would get six mayors uh, who would come in and then they would present a problem. Let's say that Kasim Reed came in and his problem was how to redevelop the area around the Falcons Stadium. And then you have a resource panel, and the resource panel would include developers, economists, architects, landscape architects, and city planners, lawyers, and so forth, and, and the other mayors. And, um, and then once the problem is presented, we would then spend a couple of hours discussing it. As I was on a resource panel several times, six times. Um, and anyway, what I wanted to, the reason I brought that up is, is that to my great surprise, uh, an interesting thing happens in that, in, in these things. They're really great, in fact, because the mayors at some point are really, really, really skeptical of this whole thing. Um, so there's always a dinner the night before it begins. Everybody gets to know everybody. There's lots of wine, lots of good food. Um, people are telling jokes, you know, all that sort of stuff. And so it relaxes them a little bit. But then after about half a day, what the mayors realize is the press is not in the room. Um, the cabinet's not in the room. The city council is not in the room. The political opposition is not in the room. Um, and there are among their peers other mayors. And so they relax, and they begin to open up about their problems. And the mayors, the other mayors, really can empathize with that, and they get in there, and they are sometimes the harshest critics of all, right? But what struck me, and I was pleasantly surprised by these experiences, is that mayors, by and large, I can only think, I think we looked all together at something like 49 cities, ranging from, you know, Clarksville, Tennessee to Fort Lauderdale, that with only two exceptions that I can think of, these mayors really loved their cities and really wanted to do the right thing. And typically the problems that they were facing did not have obvious solutions. And they were there doing their dead level best to try to understand what the right thing to do would be. And I was sort of heartened by that. You know, you tend to get cynical in our political climate in this country. 
like in most countries, but you, it's easy to get cynical. Um, and um, it was kind of uh, heartwarming to see these mayors caring as much about their cities as they actually do. The mayor of St. Louis actually worded it similarly. That's where I got this idea that we are the curators of this thing. Uh, we inherit it from others, and we have to do the best we can for uh, both the present and the future generations yet unborn to, to accommodate their, their needs. Um, and he articulated it really that way. It was really quite remarkable. Um, these are not these these. So the mayor of Milwaukee was really quite, as I said, quite astute and was was very much in that in that mode of thinking about you know how can we develop sort of uh, principles for development of cities that that ultimately would make life better in our cities and our towns. Uh, it's quite. Um, reassuring, actually, in what is otherwise a cynical world. Did I answer your question? Okay. Anything else? Well, on Friday, um, we will um, look at um, we will look at uh, Atlanta and sort of in the early days of the city and sort of see how the city emerged from the simple assemblage of boundaries and streets and public places and the circumstances of topography and other things that conditioned it, right? So we can sort of take, you know, everything we've discussed in this course from the beginning, from the get-go, and then sort of see how that plays out. Um, and I will upload that, uh, plus uh, an, a chapter I have written in a book to be published in April uh, by the American Planning Association uh, the, it's titled Learning from Atlanta. It's the introductory chapters, 5,000 words. It's not 4,800 words, easy to read, uh, which just takes you through the early days of, of the formation of the city. And I will sort of give away some of that now by saying that the guy who surveyed it um, was offered in payment, like Leon Creer was given a lot, was offered in, pay, in payment a land lot. And he said, no, I don't need it. Um, in fact, this site is worth nothing. It's, uh, it will have, it's good for a blacksmith shop, a tavern. Um, that's about it, right? And yet it is today the ninth largest metropolitan area in North America and the sixth largest urban economy. He should have taken that land lot. Right? Could have secured his future. Any other questions? Well, adios. <laughs>